Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Deanna Hilscher, and I'm the Regional Dean for the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin and Director of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. I'm also Principal Investigator of the Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition, or Texas SPAN survey that monitors the prevalence of child health in school-aged children in Texas. The Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living is sponsoring today's webinar. The center's vision is healthy children in a healthy world, and we know that you can't have healthy kids without healthy parents and healthy communities. So we take a holistic view of child health. Our mission is to advance health and healthy living for children and their families through cutting edge research, innovative community-based programs, and dissemination of evidence-based practices. And you'll hear a lot about that in today's lecture. Next slide. Give me just a moment here. Okay. Ah, perfect. So the funding for today's webinar is provided by the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So we're really thankful for their support that allows us to bring these webinars to you free of charge. The Texas SPAN project was funded by Texas Department of State Health Services. So we'd like to thank them for their support of Texas SPAN. So information about our center's work and resources can be found online. So if you're interested in any of our resources, please feel free to scan the QR code and visit our website. Uh, you'll find a lot of uh, useful information there. Be sure to check up our upcoming center webinars as well. So we have one on Thursday of this week about nutrition interventions among formerly chronically homeless adults. Uh, so that'll give you some really interesting uh, new work that's being done in the Houston area. And then we'll be talking about Tucker's Law and Best Practices in Youth Substance Misuse Prevention next week on Tuesday. We also lead the Texas Research to Policy Collaboration or the Texas RPC project, which has legislative resources described on this page. So we have a lot of uh, one pagers, we have lunch and learn presentations and so on. So if you're interested in any of those, uh, any of that information, please feel free to scan the QR code here. And now we'd like to uh, move on to the webinar today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Flutterer. So Dr. Flutterer is an assistant professor at the UT Health Houston School of Public Health in Austin and a member of the Center for Dell Center for Healthy Living. Uh, Dr. Flutterer's work involves finding ways to optimize the scale up of childhood obesity related interventions from both implementation and translational perspectives. With specific expertise in school based physical activity movement, he, he serves as both a researcher and former K 12 teacher. So he's uniquely positioned to support Texas SPAN's goal of measuring the health of school-aged children in Texas. So he aims to leverage his professional experiences to enhance physical activity interventions in rural communities. And his current focus has expanded to compare 24, the 24-hour 24 movement behavior cycle. So here's Dr. Flutterer with his presentation. Dr. Flutterer? Thanks, Dr. Helsher, for that lovely introduction. As she said, I'm Chris Flutter, and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into youth movement behaviors. And uh, on the agenda, we're we're first going to talk about what the 24-hour movement behaviors are, 
and we'll discuss uh, current guidelines for 24-hour movement behaviors. And then what the bulk of the presentation is going to be is understanding how we can integrate context into some of the 24-hour movement behavior research that we do. Um, and so we'll highlight examples of, of how that's done with a few Texas SPAN studies. And then we'll also talk about a few other studies where context has been addressed. And then I'll also highlight some next steps in movement behavior research moving forward. And then we'll have time for some Q&A. So the 24-hour movement behaviors, you know, it's it's a newer field, and so they they go by a lot of different names. Sometimes you might see them as the 24-hour recommendations. Uh, a lot of people call them the 24 activity cycle, but essentially they're three behaviors. And these are, if you think about moving throughout the day, there's only three things that you can be doing. You can be physically active, you can be sedentary, and that might include screen time as well, uh, or you can be sleeping. So here's your 24-hour day. It starts at midnight on, uh, you know, early early in the morning, and then it ends at 11:59 p.m. And those 24 hours equal 1,440 minutes. So you can be sleeping during a portion of that time. You can be physically active, um, or you can be sedentary during those 1,440 minutes. So here might be a, a typical day for an adult. Uh, you know, we we see you at your start of your 24-hour movement cycle. It's it's midnight, and hopefully at that point you're sleeping. And maybe you get up at 6 a.m. and you're really motivated. So you do some physical activity, you do some exercise. Then it's time to go to work. So you take your car to work, and you're sedentary probably for most of the day. Uh, maybe you get up after lunch and do a walking meeting. Then you know you're sedentary again. Uh, you get back in your car. You get home. Maybe you're outside. You're playing with your kids. You're gardening. Uh, there's probably a little bit of sedentary activity in between there as well as you wind down for the day. And uh, then you go to sleep. So as researchers, what we are interested in is what is the physical activity or what is the movement behavior profile of this 24-hour day. So if this were a research study, this person would have, you know, probably an accelerometer on their wrist and it would be measuring their activity. And you can get a readout of kind of a, a day in the life of someone where, you know, in this case, they were active for 140 minutes, they slept for 480 minutes, and then they were sedentary for 820 minutes. And then what we would do is we would probably measure you throughout the week, Monday through Sunday, and, you know, in, in general, you're going to see a little bit of variability there where some days you're at very active, some days you're not active at all, some days you get more sleep than others. And we would take those estimates and we would make a weekly average for you. And so this is your weekly average. You know, on average, you got about 60 minutes of physical activity during the day, and then you can see the breakdown of sleep and sedentary behavior here. Now, for adults, the way we handle the physical activity guidelines is a little bit different. It's actually a summation of your weekly activity, uh, but it does include an intensity threshold there. So you're, you may have gotten a lot of physical activity, but most of that may have been light physical activity. And so we would wanna see 150 minutes per week of, of moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity. For sedentary behavior, we don't actually have a, a quantity or a guideline that we need to hit for the, the act of being sedentary, but we do have a quantity or guideline for screen time, which is typically done when you're sedentary. And we should be hitting you know, less than two hours a day of screen time. So I appreciate you all spending uh, half of your screen time uh, watching this presentation today. And then for sleep, we should be getting um, at least seven hours per night. For kids, it's a little bit different. For kids, uh, we do use a, a day level, um, you know, this is based on averages, but we use a day level. So kids should be getting 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every single day. The screen time guideline is the same. Uh, for, for most ages, there is some variation across the ages, uh, but kids should be getting less than two hours a day of, of recreational screen time or non-educational screen time. And then depending on the age of the child, they should be getting either nine to 12 hours if they're younger or eight to 10 hours um, if they're a little bit older. But a kid's day, 
looks a lot different than an adult's day. Uh, so if we take a kid, uh, maybe this child is, is, you know, sleeping as they should until maybe about 7 a.m. And then during a school day, they get up and they have different modes of travel to school. So maybe they are active on a bike or they're walking to school or maybe they're taking the bus or they're doing a carpool or they're getting a ride from their family. And then throughout the school day, there are some opportunities to get up and move. They have recess, they have sports practice. So there's some variability there within the school day. And then the same thing on the back end. And then you do have a period of time, you know, typically between 3 and 5 p.m. where uh, students might be in after school programs or they have sports practice or they're outside playing. Um, they might ne not necessarily be with adults and then they're home and, you know, doing their thing at home and then they fall asleep. So a kid's day looks a little bit different. And when you think about a, a kid's day at school, we can say, well, you know, this is Monday through Friday, they're in school, they're, it's, it's pretty structured. Uh, but, you know, what happens on the, the weekends or what happens during the summer when we have some of that structure taken away? And I really like this quote, it comes from Doug Larson and it says, for disappearing acts, it's hard to beat what happens to the eight hours supposedly left after eight of sleep and eight of work. And for kids, we can kind of alter that and say, you know, what happens to the eight hours supposedly left after eight of sleep and eight of school? And then the bigger question is, of course, what happens on the weekends and during the summer? Uh, so this is where we start to get into the, port, the, uh, the importance of context when we talk about child 24-hour movement behaviors. Uh, because a lot of research has estimated what these behaviors are, but not a lot of research has gone into, you know, what are these kids doing during the day and what can help influence them meeting recommendations. And this variability actually has implications for how we even interpret the guidelines. So we're going to take a quick detour before we get to the SPAN studies, because uh, I want to highlight how this variability and this, this notion of um, what's happening during the day can impact how we, how we see kids meeting or not meeting the guidelines. So this is a, a study that we published a couple months ago, uh, but it comes from not SPAN data, but data from a cohort out of South Carolina. And uh, there's gonna be a lot of words on the screen, but I'll break it down for you. So the, the idea of this study was, you know, the, the common practice is to average your movement behaviors across multiple days. And that's something that I highlighted when, you know, we saw those weekly averages across the screen. But if we think of kids' guidelines, especially physical activity, those guidelines are framed as a daily, um, a, a daily physical activity guideline and a daily sleep or screen time guideline. But there, there is some natural day-to-day -day variability in youth movement behavior patterns. So when we use these averages, you know, you can have kids kind of have days off from meeting the guidelines because you're kind of washing out all that variability. And that variability can have implications for how we inter interpret the proportion of children meeting those guidelines and it may also underscore the need for context. So the, the data that we used, it was really great data. We had uh, over 500 participants. We had over 12,000 observation days. Um, and this is the proportion of weekdays and weekend days. So we had about 12 and a half days of accelerometry on these kids. Um, with screen time, we did use a parent survey, but it was a daily parent survey because it's really hard to capture objective screen time. And we were interested in, you know, be, because of this variability, what does that do when we look at, okay, 25% of kids are meeting the guidelines? You know, what, what's happening on the day-to-day -day level? So this is box plots of each individual in that sample, and we color-coded them with red if they didn't meet the guideline, and then blue if they did meet the guideline. Uh, so you see an individual, it's kind of hard to see the individual lines, but each individual line is a participant in the sample. And then the black line is the, the guideline for your movement behaviors. So if you're looking at this, if, if we take physical activity for an example, this group who did not meet the guidelines, if we take this participant maybe, you can see on some days they, they actually did meet the guidelines, but on average, you know, we would classify them as not. And then the same can be said for those that did meet the guidelines. There are a lot of days where uh, their physical activity did not go above that 60 
minute threshold. And so you have some classification issues there. We can highlight this even more with uh, four individuals. So this is four individuals taken randomly from the sample. And we've, we've plotted their minutes of physical activity, their sleep and their screen time. Uh, again, this black line represents the, the recommendation. So if they're above it, they met the recommendation. If they're below it, they didn't meet the recommendation on a given day. And uh, again, let, let's take this, this orange participant here. So on Sunday and Thursday, they did indeed meet the guideline and they just eked out on that next Tuesday meeting the guideline. But if we look at their average, they would be classified as not meeting the guideline, even though they got really close. Um, what's, what's even more, I guess, um, uh, illustrative of this example is this person in red, where they met the guideline on five of their days, but on the other five of their days, half of their days, they didn't. But still, when we average their data, they did. And so if we were you know, putting this into some sort of a model, that participant with all of their demographics, uh, with all of their information, would be modeled as someone who met the guideline, even though they only met it on half the days. So the question then becomes, what is happening at this day level? What are the contexts in which this child is meeting a physical activity or a, a sleep or a screen time guideline. So it's different if you look at your weekly or whole of data averages. So the next question becomes, okay, what's the context here? What's driving that participant to be physically active on some days, but not physically active on others? And when we think about context, you know, in, in general, the, the basic definition is, you know, it's, it's who you're with, it's, it's what you're doing, it's, it's where you are. But I really like to use um, this socio-ecological model of active living. Um, it's, it's from Jen Salas's work. And it gives you a wider range of some of the context that we can explore when we have 24-hour movement, movement behavior data. Um, so it's things like your socioeconomic status, all your different demographics. Not only is it your built environment, your natural environment, but it's also your perceived environment and all the other contexts that go along with that. And then the one thing that's not included in this model is the context of time. So we talk about weekend, weekday, we talk, to, we talk about summers. You know, in Texas, it's really, really hot in the summer, and so kids might be indoors more than they're outdoors, which may be different than in a different state or a different country. Uh, so there's time and there's weather, and there's, there's all those different contexts that we, need to, um, that we need to keep in mind when we're doing movement behavior research, uh, especially with kids. So I'm going to go into our SPAN studies, and, and these are two studies where, you know, it doesn't solve or answer all the questions that we have about context and 24-hour movement behavior research, but what it does is it highlights ways in which we can use some secondary data to answer some of those contextual questions. So again, it's not going to solve all of our problems here, um, but, but there are some really neat ways that we can use context to our advantage, even with secondary survey data. So these are the two studies I'll highlight. The first one is um, about physical activity context and children meeting daily physical activity guidelines. So we look at the role of outdoor play, sports, other organized activities, and active commuting. And then the second study, we're going to look at context-specific screen time and sleep. So we'll hit all three of our movement behaviors uh, just in different studies. A little bit about Texas SPAN, the Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition Survey. This is a statewide representative survey. We uh, survey schools in these public health regions, these Texas, Texas public health regions. And the goal of the survey, the overall goal, um, was to monitor trends in body mass index of school-aged children. So we have data on second, fourth, eighth, and 11th grades. Um, and again, this is a, a statewide representative sample. And we, in the data collection, we do all sorts of really neat things. One of them is objective measures of height and weight to monitor that body mass index. But then we have this really great comprehensive survey. We're going to be focusing mainly on the physical activity behaviors, uh, but, but we are able to get really good data on all, all sorts of other things as well. And if anyone in the webinar wants to know more about Texas SPAN, uh, you can scan that QR code. And I believe the link will also be provided um, on the website. 
So let's get into our first study, examining associations between physical activity context and children meeting daily guidelines. The purpose of the study was to understand how these structured physical activities, things like sports, other out of school structured activities like boys and girls clubs, um, maybe 4-H or YMCA or other things that they're doing that weren't sports, um, active travel to school and outdoor play, unstructured outdoor play, associate with the number of days fourth grade children met those guidelines. And this, this data, so it's only for fourth grade children and it's coming from the 2019-2020 Texas Span Survey. So keep that in mind as we go through some of the results. So here's a, a basic breakdown of some of the demographics for the, for the sample that we used in this study. I'll call your attention first to the number of days that kids met the guidelines. So one really neat thing about the Texas Span Survey is we actually ask um, at the day level. So on Monday, did you meet the physical activity guidelines on Tuesday, on Wednesday and Thursday? And that has implications for how we can use that physical activity data uh, in light of context. And then we also have the average, uh, the, the overall average. So on average, kids are meeting the guidelines on about half the days of the week. I think it's interesting to compare this to some national data. So this data comes from the 2022 National Survey of Children's Health. You'll see uh, just some comparisons here. The sample is slightly younger overall um, by about a year than the fourth grade children that we sampled for SPAM. Uh, so keep that in mind. But the, the, the proportion of children meeting the physical activity guidelines is, is pretty close, although fourth grade children in Texas are, are slightly lower than the national average, at least based on this year's survey. So just to give you an idea of, of uh, national comparison. And then I'll call your attention to some of the contextual factors that we are interested in. So the number of sports teams that these kids participated in in the past 12 months, other organized physical activity, their commute mode to school, and then the mean number of days of outdoor play in the past week. So about 35% of the sample aren't participating in sports teams in the past year. Um, about half the sample do participate in other organized physical activity and a, a very small percentage do actively commute. And then they're getting about four out of the seven days um, where, they're, where they're playing outdoors. So let's look at the first level of context that, that uh, we explored in this study. The first was understanding what happens on the weekdays versus the weekends. So this is a plot, a daily plot of uh, kids, the proportion of kids meeting the physical activity guidelines. So the, the orange bar is the total, and then we separate it out by different demographic variables of interest. And the main highlight here is that significantly fewer children met physical activity guidelines on the weekend. So 60% compared to 55%. Now this isn't something that surprised us. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, when you take out school, when you take out some of that structure, um, it's been argued that the 24 hour movement guideline adherence kind of suffers from that. So in this case, physical activity on the weekends, when you take out school, there may not be as many opportunities for that. So that's, that's the first level of context that we can look at, weekday versus weekend day. Let's look at some of our overall results for the context of physical activity and then the number of days kids meet the physical activity guidelines. So the way to read this graph is uh, here's your context down here, here's the association with the number of days kids meet the guidelines, and then this red line, you know, if your error bars don't cross and they're above the red line, then that means you've got a positive association between that specific context and the number of days you're meeting the guidelines. So overall, for the total sample, we saw that sports participation, not surprisingly, associated with a greater number of days meeting those guidelines. Other organized physical activity did as well. And then um, outdoor play, which was kind of the, the standout here, we can see the strength of the association is, is very strong compared to the others uh, positively associated with those guidelines. And then what we did is we added another level of context. So we compared, we compared um, these different contexts across uh, boys and girls. We can see similar findings where, you know, sports is moving the needle, but it, it, there is a bit of a dose response relationship between boys and girls with outdoor play where, you know, 
any amount of outdoor play is going to associate with meeting the guidelines and girls wear as with um, boys, you need at least four to seven days. We also split the sample into schools that were um, considered higher percent economic disadvantage and schools that were lower percent economic disadvantage. And you can see similar trends across those associations. And then the final split we did is we split this um, by boys and girls and by um, economic disadvantage. And across all the models, Outdoor play was the one consistent positive predictor of the number of days children met physical activity guidelines. So this study highlights that outdoor play might be a context, if we were just to design an intervention for fourth grade kids in Texas, outdoor play may be a really good option for that because um, across boys and girls, across levels of economic disadvantage, we see that moving the needle on physical activity guideline adherence. So that's our first example of how we might be able to explore context with some secondary data from the SPAN study. The, the second example of this, this was um, a neat study that, that hasn't been published yet, it's still in the works, but we were interested in how different types of screen time uh, influence meeting physical activity guidelines. Um, because if you think about screen time, you know, you've got, you've got educational screen time, which that, that's not part of the guidelines. Um, but in, in terms of your recreational screen time, you can kind of split it into two. You have your passive screen time or passive media use where you know, you're sitting in front of a TV, there's not much interaction going on probably. And then you have interactive media use where you know, that would be represented by spending time playing computer games or, or um, video games. And we actually asked that question in the SPAN survey. So this is another level of context. Uh, we ask about screen time in general, but we also ask, you know, how long did you spend watching TV? How long did you spend playing video games? So we're able to kind of parse out those associations. And the idea was that passive media use and interactive media use would have different influences on kids meeting um, the sleep guidelines. This data comes from an older survey, so the 2015-2016 SPAN survey, and we're also looking at older uh, grades. So we used the 8th and 11th grade sample for this, for this study. Again, here are some basic demographics of the 8th and 11th graders used in this study. Uh, we'll call your attention first to the uh, sleep and screen time guidelines here. And we can also do some comparisons again with our National Survey of Children's Health. I've subsetted this data so it just includes those 13 to 17 years. So this isn't the this isn't the full sample. This is just those that are a little bit older. Um, and the first thing you'll notice um, again, you know, the age isn't exactly comparable, so you have to keep that in mind. But we can look at uh, who's meeting sleep guidelines, and you'll see that you know nationally. Uh, about 70% are meeting sleep guidelines based on 2022 data from this survey. Um, and if we look at 8th and 11th graders, that, that number kind of declines as you get older. Um, but if I were to display the national data based on age, you would see a similar decline in um, kids meeting sleep guidelines, which is unfortunate. And then in terms of screen time, we're, we're pretty spot on with national averages. So this is the the percentage uh, or the proportion of kids nationally who are meeting those screen time guidelines. And then this is the breakdown of different types of screen time um, and kids who are, who are meeting those guidelines. So we're, we're pretty close to the national averages there. So again, a fun thing to look at comparing Texas to the, to the rest of the United States. So again, back to our purpose here, this is a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. And what you're seeing is just our, our two uh, main predictors of interest here, passive screen time and, and interactive screen time. You can see the things that we controlled for in our models, things like physical activity, uh, body mass index, and other um, behavioral and demographic variables. And then our main outcome here was sleep duration. So let's look at some results. Uh, the first result was a bit surprising, and we're going to talk about it uh, after I go through the rest of them. But TV screen time, passive screen time, actually had a protective association with sleep duration among, uh, among 11th grade adolescents. We didn't see any association, any significant association 
with eighth grade adolescents. And this is a surprising outcome, and, and we'll talk about it here in a second. And then with interactive screen time, uh, playing video or computer games was associated with increased odds of short sleep duration or increased odds of not meeting the guidelines among eighth grade adolescents. And if we look at some of the, the strengths of these association, uh, compared to not playing any video games, less than two hours was associated with 2.8 times the odds of short sleep duration. And then if you played more than two hours per day, um, that was associated with 3.6 times the odds of short sleep duration. So we do see some, some differential associations between passive and interactive screen time uh, with, with sleep. So let's go back to this uh, kind of surprising result. Uh, the fact that passive screen time had a protective effect on sleep duration among the older adolescents. But if we really dig into the data, um, uh, we found that only 8% reported not watching any amount of TV. So a very small percentage of folks uh, were, were not watching any TV at all. And, and that, was, that was our comparator there. Um, and, and this is where, you know, when we talk about context, it can really lead you down a rabbit hole. Uh, when we saw these findings, I was like, oh, you know, I, I wish we had some more contextual information on that 8% that reported not watching any amount of TV. Because, you know, questions we had were, do students who watch no TV, do they just have busier schedules? Are they staying up later to complete homework? or to attend extracurricular events? Do they have late nights going to sporting events? Are other factors at play that may kind of interfere with that association between screen time or not, not getting any screen time from TV um, and sleep? And so these are the types of questions that we can ask with even more context. Um, but in support of our hypothesis, we did find that yes, there are differences in the type of screen time or the context of screen time and its association with sleep duration. So not all screen time in this case is created equal. And this contextual information is helpful because most studies and the current 24 hour movement recommendations, they treat screen time as a single variable. So most of the time it's just any non-educational screen time, it's put together um, into one variable. And so, you know, looking at the guidelines even further, it may be important to parse out what types of screen time kids are getting uh, above and beyond just non-educational or educational screen time. So those are two examples of how we uh, can look at context at a secondary level. Um, again, it's not going to answer all the questions we have, um, but, but it does give you an idea of how you can, you know, incorporate context into some of these studies. Uh, and as promised, I wanted to talk a little bit about next steps in movement behavior research and how we can even uh, um, have context as a more powerful variable when we, when we look at uh, movement behaviors. And what I want to briefly talk about is uh, within-person research designs. So far, what we've looked at are the between-person research designs, uh, where we're comparing, you know, a group of children in one context versus a group of children in another context. So that was what we were doing with our SPAN studies. And again, this allows us to answer the question, does a participant in a certain context have more or less of a behavior than a participant, a different participant in another context? But within person designs are a little bit different because now we can answer the question, does a change in a context correspond to a change in a behavior for that same participant? So you can almost think of it like a case control study. So I wanna highlight how this can be done in research. Um, and, and this is a study, again, that, that's not SPAN related. It's a study that came out last year that we did. Um, again, this was data from South Carolina. But, but basically, we are interested in looking at the impact of virtual versus in-person school on meeting 24-hour movement, uh, movement behavior guidelines. So we had data collected in the fall of 2020, which is, you know, right when kind of the implications for COVID were happening in the schools. And... Uh, in, in South Carolina and many other states, schools were implementing these hybrid attendance where you had some days where you were in school and then other days where you were out of school. So if I was a kid in school, maybe on Monday and Wednesday, I would go to school in person and then the rest of the days I would go to school online. And 
we had these daily diaries that we sent out to participants. And one of the questions we had on those daily diaries was, did you attend school in person or virtually for that given day? And we were measuring movement behaviors with accelerometry. Again, screen time was captured um, with a, with a self-report, uh, but with sleep and physical activity, we did have this accelerometry data and we had it across two weeks. And we had data for almost 700 kids in the fall of 2020 with these daily diaries attached. And this kind of uh, recipe gave us the perfect opportunity to do one of these within person analyses, looking at context and 24 hour movement behavior guideline adherence. So we had objective measures, which is always nice. We had these daily diaries where we were able to look at context. So in this case, impact of virtual versus in-person school. And then we had hybrid attendance where the same kid was differing their context throughout the week. So we, again, we had the perfect recipe for this within person analysis where we were able to answer the question, does a change in school setting correspond to a change in movement behaviors for a given participant? So let's look at some of our results here. Uh, this is the breakdown of all of our movement behaviors and we had data across uh, K through five. And on the Y axis, you'll see the proportion of days that children met the 24 hour guidelines. And the blue are representing the days that those children were attending school in person. And then the orange are the days um, that they were attending school virtually. And again, this is a comparison between the same participants. So if we look at, let's say the second grade sample here, um, we can see that when a child was attending school virtually, um, only 6.6% of their days did they meet all the guidelines. But if they were attending school in person, 20% of those days in person um, were, were where they had guideline achievement. If we look at physical activity, we can see a similar, we can see a um, kind of a similar association here, uh, maybe with second grade where if you're attending school virtually, only 52 or about half your days, and then about 60% of your days in person. Um, but we can see that across, although sleep is a little bit different. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, this gives you a, a better idea. So the, these are the minutes per day of each 24 hour movement behavior. And then this is your guideline here. Um, so for moderate to vigorous physical activity, you can see a decline across grade levels. So this would be our between person analysis where we're comparing you know, kindergartners to fifth grade. And, and this is not surprising as children age, you know, the, the tendency for them to meet the guidelines decreases. And we see that with our data, but we do see these differences. Um, you know, when, when a child is attending in-person school, their, their physical activity is up. And on days when that same child is attending virtual school, their physical activity is down. Um, and then with screen time, it was, you know, it, it was this crazy association. And we even controlled for educational screen time. So this is, these plots are just showing recreational screen time where days when you're attending school virtually, your recreational screen time is way up compared to, compared to when you're attending school in person. With sleep, we saw something a little bit different. And uh, for sleep overall, we saw that when you're attending school virtually, uh, you actually had uh, greater odds or, or more sleep than when you were attending school in person. And I think part of that is probably, uh, you know, school times, you know, if you're attending school in person, you're getting up earlier. Um, whereas if you're attending school virtually, you can kind of roll out of bed and you might have um, greater sleep duration. But what we didn't look at is, um, you know, sleep quality and sleep timing, which is something that I think would, would show um, even more context when we look at these movement behaviors. So these within-person designs, as you can see, they can be really powerful when we're, when we're trying to um, look at context and 24-hour movement behaviors with kids. But they are challenging to conduct. And we do need to make sure that we account for these carryover effects. So what's happening on day one, you know, sometimes those, those associations, those things happening on day one can carry over because you're looking at the same individual. And then these studies can be difficult to scale at a population level because you do need that day level contextual information. 
So that's something that's really hard to capture, um, let's say with like uh, the Texas span, which is a statewide representative sample. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna end the talk with just a just a few bullet points here on uh, you know some of the next steps I think would uh, will be happening with movement behavior research. Uh, 24-hour movement behavior research is rather new. There's all sorts of really great analyses that you can do now. Uh, compositional data analysis, CODA, isotemporal substitution. There's longitudinal methodology. Uh, so there's really great things that, that are being done. So keep your eye on the literature because things are moving quickly in this space. Uh, but there is a lot of methodological heterogeneity because the field is new. And so this heterogeneity needs to be addressed, how things are reported and, and how people are conducting analyses. And then of course, I, I'm sure you've seen if you're attending this webinar, uh, there's a lot of papers out on the optimal compositions of 24-hour movement behaviors for a host of different health outcomes. and um, you know, more health outcomes need to be explored when we look at these, these compositions. In terms of context, there are several advances in how we contextualize 24-hour movement behavior research at the day level. And these things are changing every single day. And uh, people are doing some really neat stuff with this day level contextual information. Um, and, and this can be really powerful when we are trying to understand what works in specific contexts especially for intervention design. So, you know, for our fourth grade children in Texas, maybe outdoor play is the way to go for our intervention design. Uh, maybe that's a context that we need to explore a little bit more. But again, intervention scalability issues still remain because if we're designing interventions in a specific context, how do we know they're gonna scale to a different context? And so that, you know, that's where things kind of get tricky. But, but I think all of these things are uh, things that will be started um, to get solved maybe in the next 10 to 15 years as we as we look at more 24-hour movement behavior research methodology. So I, I took you down a long road of 24-hour movement behavior research with kids. Um, I threw a lot at you today, but I, I really do appreciate you for, for hanging in there. And um, I, I'm available for any questions that you may have. And if, if your question doesn't get answered during the webinar, please feel free to reach out. Uh, to my email there on the screen. And uh, thank you again. Excellent webinar, uh, Chris. So uh, we have some questions and then I have some questions too, as you were going through. So uh, one question asked about on the Venn diagrams that you were showing, um, about the percent of kids meeting various behaviors is 21%, I think that was for the fourth graders, that meet physical activity but not other behaviors, or is 21% the total that met physical activity, whether or not they met the other behaviors? That's a, that's a great question. Um, let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can go back to that real quick. Uh, yeah. Just to give you an idea here. Okay. So this is probably the slide that they had the question on. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I didn't explain how to read this Venn diagram. Uh, this is a great way to represent 24-hour movement behaviors in terms of who's meeting guidelines and who's not. And so I, I think that the person asking the question was spot on. So this 21% represents just uh, the proportion of kids who are meeting just the physical activity guidelines and these overlaps. So if we look at these overlaps, it would be 15% are meeting sleep and physical activity concurrently. And if we look at this overlap, it would be 9.8% of kids are meeting sleep, screen time, and physical activity concurrently. So uh, one kind of follow-up is I think the National Survey of Children's Health, and I haven't looked to see if they've changed the methodology, but my understanding is the parents answer that those questions, whereas yes. in SPAN, the children answer those questions. So that yes. is one difference in those as well. That is correct, yeah. The, the, the type of reporting, uh, the way that it's reported is also different. So that's another difference I didn't highlight when we're looking at those national averages. So there, there may be some uh, heterogeneity there as well to account for. Uh, 
So um, I love the idea of looking at context and see how it's very important. But I did have a question about outdoor play. And I love that because uh, that was a question I kind of uh, lobbied to get on the questionnaire. Um, and it's uh, kind of showing what I expected it might show. Um, but uh, particularly with girls and outdoor play, but for all kids, you know, kind of when you look at it, uh, one of the things that we found in our street study was that uh, the kids during the pandemic that were more likely to maintain their physical activity during the pandemic were those that were in cohesive neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is we did a previous study with active commuting to school, uh, which, you know, is a different behavior. But what we found is parents were less likely to have their girls walk to school because of safety issues, uh, whereas boys, they were, you know, they were less likely to limit their uh, independent mobility. So um, do you want to say something about that in terms of intervention strategies, ex especially in the environment and maybe focused especially on girls? This is a great question. Um, and it's something that we bring up in the discussion of that paper, which hopefully should be published soon. Um, are, are these differences, not, not only the, the differences in girls and boys, but also the differences uh, when we look at the, the socioeconomic status of the neighborhoods that we're in too, because that can have uh, implications for the built environment. Um, the other thing I want to highlight uh, before I directly answer your question is mm -hmm. um, it, it's not just the the objective because we have you know we have like objective measures of the built environment and we have objective measures of sa of safety, so things like crime rates and, and you know other things like that. But it's also the perceived Mm -hmm. uh, environment. So your your perceived safety and your objective safety could be completely different. And and studies have have shown we I published one, geez, it was a few years ago uh, for my during my PhD, um, looking at differences in perceived safety with boys and girls, parent perceived safety with boys and girls, and active commuting to school. And th there were differences there. And so I think a, a really good intervention strategy to, to target that is, is, is targeting parents and, and their perceived safety of the built environment. So what do they perceive to be safe? What are the things they perceive not to be safe? And what are some intervention strategies? It doesn't have to be going in and changing the built environment, but it could be educational strategies to incre increase that perceived safety. It could also be self-efficacy. So if a parent doesn't think that their child is able to bike to school, whether because of concerns of walking the street um, or even crossing the street or getting to school, um, I, I've seen some studies where they provide parents, the school provides parents with uh, safe streets to school maps, and then they're able to actually you know, give them the information to map a safe route to school or a walking and a biking bus where um, a, a parent leads a group of children to school every single day. So there's ways that we can, you know, target this perceived safety and hopefully increase it in the parent's mind to, to make it a little bit more easier uh, for them to give their child the reins to walk or bike to school. Yeah, I really like that because we found that in some other work that we've done as well. Uh, and uh, measuring it objectively, it's safe, but the parents still think it's not safe. Yeah. Uh, so that's really interesting to me. Um, another kind of following up on that, too, um, is with the team sports. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking uh, with the associations that you found, uh, one of the things is as kids go into middle and high school, the opportunities for team sports decreases, um, especially because in some of the schools, especially some of the larger schools, uh, not everybody can participate on teams. Uh, those that are more athletic kind of go on. Those that don't have a natural aptitude uh, tend to fall off. And especially for girls, uh, 
you know, that those declines are pretty steep and sometimes they don't have as many team opportunities either as boys do. So uh, I think that uh, what could be some school level uh, kind of interventions that the schools could do to kind of help that, because a lot of the team sports, they're not all through school, but it could be school or community maybe. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll mention, again, we talk about it in the discussion of the paper, so I'm glad you're bringing it up, and um, I hope it gets published soon so everyone can read it, is is the the cost of, of doing these sports. Um, so it's, e even if it is school-sponsored, you know, the, the cost of participating in sport can be prohibitive, even if it's someone who's really good at the sport, um, you know, that they, they may not be able to afford all the best gear and, and everything else. And when we talk about club sports uh, or you know the, the opportunity to train throughout the year on a club sport is is wildly expensive. Um, so I you know I think one intervention strategy is to offer you know more more intramural or more organized physical activity that isn't sport based in the school setting. So if you remember on, on those associations. Uh, yes, sports did drive physical activity, but other organized physical activities also uh, were, were positive um, in terms of the number of days meeting physical activity guidelines. So it doesn't have to be sports-based. It can be some other um, physical activity organized um, idea that, that schools may adopt. And they don't always have to be these, these high cost options either. Um, you know, there's there's several low cost organized uh, physical activity programs out there. I know, you know, if we talk about like the YMCA and the boys and girls clubs and there's, um, you know, those groups doing vouchers to those types of things. So that's another great intervention strategy where uh, you get, you've got some grant money and you provide vouchers for access to these programs. Um, so, so there are ways around those, those cost prohibitive uh, types of activities. Yeah, I can remember when my daughter was in volleyball and she was in uh, club volleyball that one of the clubs there, I can remember talking to one of the parents and they had the child choose between getting a car or participating in the club uh, because it was so expensive they could afford to buy her a car if she didn't participate in the club volleyball. I'll uh, say one other thing too. Uh, so I didn't mention this study because I knew I wouldn't have enough time, but um, we're, we're currently looking at some of the uh, out of school and weekend structured activities that associate with these 24 hour movement behaviors. And um, th there was another study published by uh, folks at our center uh, or our uh, university looking at the role of volunteering with some of these uh, mental health outcomes. Well, we found volunteering um, out of school and on the weekends actually also positively associates with meeting 24-hour movement behavior recommendations. So that's another, you know, volunteering typically is completely free and it, it also helps the communities and it comes with a host of, of all sorts of other um, uh, benefits, mental health benefits, but we've actually been seeing that it also does uh, associate with meeting sleep, screen time, and physical activity guidelines on the weekends and uh, out of school time. So that's another opportunity that, that might be available. Oh, I love that. And a lot of times uh, students need that. The In addition to just uh, the benefits of feeling good and mental health, but it's also good for them in terms of development. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's a great idea. So uh, one more question, uh, with the uh, virtual uh, versus in-school physical activity differences, um, what do you think is going to happen now? You know, so it seems like there's a lot of students that for a year or two perhaps kind of missed out on some of that physical activity that they got. You know, because you had schools that did both, right? Uh, the hybrid. But what about schools that didn't do hybrid and were totally virtual? Um, you know, do you what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that the kids just kind of 
lost out on some of that. And, and anyway, it's interesting to me because you have this point in time where they weren't getting that physical activity. So, yeah, it's a great question. I don't have, I don't have an answer for you in terms of what I think is going to happen. But what I do know is that a, a lot of people are looking at that right now in terms of the the spillover effects on the pandemic in terms of school closures and, and all the other things that happened uh, during the pandemic. I'll, I'll give a shout out to Ethan Hunt, another faculty member. He's doing some great things with um, some really large cohort data, looking at some of those health outcomes before, during, and after the pandemic. And so those types of studies can really help us understand uh, not only what happened during, but the implications for what's happening after. Yeah, that's really an interesting area, I think. So um, one of the things, we're getting a little bit close on time now. So I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, the recording and the slides and resources mentioned will be posted on our site. So again, we'll be able to if anybody's interested in the SPAN study, you'll be able to link to that. And uh, also, uh, once the paper's published, we can also have the ability to send that out to everyone so that you can look at it. And then uh, we will see you here for our next webinar, which is at 1 p.m. on Thursday. So most of these are between 12 and 1. That, that one is a little bit later. And that's the nutrition intervention among formerly chronically homeless adults in permanent supportive housing. So once again, thank you for being here. We'd like to thank the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation for sponsoring this and uh, Dr. Flutterer for an excellent presentation. So y'all have a great rest of today and we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye everyone.